I was born and raised in, uh, in Lodi, California. And this is actually my wife, Mitzi, on the left here. Uh, her last name is Mitzi Onizuka. And my daughter, Kate, who actually now is 13. Uh, one thing to note, and it's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, funny, uh, Kevin mentioned the coincidence that he and I have regarding college, but actually Mitzi's grandmother uh, was a resident of the original Cypress home uh, way back when. And recently, uh, Kevin shared some old videos that uh, he uh, uncovered uh, from years and years ago. And I forgot to tell you this, Kevin, but actually Mitzi's grandmother is in those videos that you sent me. So she's actually there. So it was one of the first times, if not only times, that I've seen um, actual uh, video of Mitzi's grandmother because I never, I never met her in person. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was a real treat. So let me move on. I again, want to acknowledge uh, and thank the JSA folks uh, for having me tonight, in particular, Jill, Kevin, and also Yuji, who obviously uh, put together the, the great dinner tonight. So I wanted to recognize uh, all three folks for allowing me to do the presentation tonight. So real quick, for, so our, for our time this evening, um, we're going to kind of break this up into third. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, you know, my family in terms of the first generation that actually came here uh, from Japan. Uh, and we'll div dig into our, our rosé. Uh, we'll get into uh, the second generation, which is a little bit more about me and kind of what we're planning to do with a winery. And we'll, um, we'll have the petite Syrah with that. And then lastly, we'll just go over grape growing. Um, you know, it's part of my family's tradition. So I thought I would share a little bit about how grapes are uh, grown and how they go through the cycle all the way through harvest and crush. So and we'll finish that off with our Zinfandel. And again, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, but with that, let's get into wine tasting. And so Feel free to go ahead and grab your rosé at, uh, at this time, and we'll just kind of go through a quick uh, wine tasting uh, uh, checklist here. So the first thing you'll want to do is you'll want to use your eyes, actually. So you are going to take a look at the color in particular um, first. And what you're going to try and do is look for color, clarity, viscosity. So for viscosity, what that really means is you know, how does the, um, how thick, if you will, is the wine? You know, is it watery and thin? Is it a little bit of a thicker wine? Uh, and you'll also want to notice the legs on, on the glass. And by legs, when you swirl your, for those of you who can maybe see me in the side screen, when you swirl the wines, um, you'll see streaks um, running down your wine glass and those are legs. And uh, one indicator of the alcohol content of the of the wine and so you'll want to observe uh, these four things about the wine and so moving on you'll want to go into smell so the next portion is smell so stick your nose in and you know really get the aromatics going by swirling the glass and really get your whole get your whole nose uh, in there deeply so you can get a sense for uh, what you smell Third, you know, in, they, often, they often talk about all the senses here. So in terms of hearers, uh, being able to listen, clink your glass with somebody next to you. Go ahead and do cheers so you can hear, you can hear the glass. This is all part of all your senses here. So um, go ahead and uh, cheers there. And then finally, go ahead and taste. And so for the taste, you know, you'll want to think about, okay, what was my initial impression of the wine as it entered uh, my mouth? How does it feel landing on the tongue? Um, after that, how are you thinking about the mouth feel? Was it, you know, did it coat, did it feel like a, uh, a coat that wrapped around your mouth? Um, was it, um, did it have some acidity to the, to the wine so that it wasn't flat like water? Uh, was, did it have a little bit of a zing to it? Uh, then in terms of finish, you'll be thinking about, you know, what, what were there, was there any um, tannins or bitterness to the wine? Do you feel, um, you know, um, what sort of alcohol are you uh, getting a sense of through, through the final taste? So again, if, as you go through the wines tonight, through the other reds later on, again, just think about these four elements, right? Sight, smell, hearing, which is kind of fun, but sight, smell, and taste as you go through all of these wines. All right. And if you haven't already, 
please feel free to get some water as well as a fourth glass to all your wines so that you, in between the different wines, you can cleanse your palate uh, by drinking a little bit of water. That would be great. All right, so for that first rosé, um, th these are the tasting notes that our winemaker, Kian Tavacoli, wrote up for our rosé. And as we talked about, again, from a site perspective, right, you can notice that this, this rosé, uh, as compared to a lot of rosés, for those who drink a lot of rosés, you'll notice that this is definitely a little bit darker in color than a lot of rosés. Some rosés come in a pink salmon color, oftentimes. Uh, some might even be somewhat peachy to some degree, but this is definitely more of a red color. Um, you know, in this case, you know, we, we call it pomegranate in terms of uh, the color associated with it. And as you stick your nose into the glass, you know, you'll pick up some, some bright fruitness. And that fruitness is, you know, raspberries, cherries. Uh, and uh, for those that are curious, this rosé happens to be 100% uh, of Zinfandel. So this is a fully dry, actually, rosé of Zinfandel. And so in particular, you know, this is, um, this is intended to be a, you know, a summertime wine, something during the, the hotter days where you want something really refreshing and a high acidity to really have it be an easy drinking wine. And so that's, that's what's, um, that's what's um, done here. Um, one thing to note is that stylistically for our winery, what we try and do is we actually have our rosé with a little bit of a stronger finish. It actually is, um, this happens to be a 14.8% um, alcohol rosé. And part of that reasoning is that we, Mitzi and I both really enjoy a, a more robust uh, wine, even when it comes to a rosé. We don't, we're not big fans of the sort of the lighter style of rosés. So in, in this particular case, you'll, you'll sense more um, sort of a fuller wine, if you will, for a rosé. Any questions so far that uh, people may want to ask uh, Kevin along the way here? Feel free to, feel free to ask. Okay. I'll Jason, I actually had a quick question for you. Sure. How much of the flavor of what we're tasting now comes from the grapes themselves and how much is coming from like the barrels out there uh, uh, kind of fermented in? Yeah, great question. So in this case for the rosé, um, this is almost 100% of the fruit. So we do actually, in this particular case, we do employ neutral, what we call neutral barrels. So barrels that uh, have been used multiple times. So there's, a, there's little oak influence on the rosé. So in this particular case, it's 100% the fruit. Uh, when we start talking about the red wines later, you will see more oak influence, you know, um, both in terms of the type of barrels we use, meaning whether we get it from uh, France or from American oak, um, but also the amount of what we call toast, the toast level of, uh, of the barrels, which is uh, something that's done when the barrels are constructed to add some smokiness and some additional flavoring to the, to the wine. Um, so good question. So we uh, actually have a couple of qu quick questions. Sure, um, of course. Craig, uh, can you go first? Can you unmute yourself? Uh, sure. I was just asking um, what the residual sugar is on this. Uh, this is this is fully dry. Wow, it's amazing because it's got a it's got a sweetish taste to it. So that's that's pretty amazing. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah, but fully dry. Oh, and also, yeah. um, Alan, you had a question. Yes, yeah, so when wine is described with fruit flavors, how is the fruit flavor, how is that created? I mean, is it just the luck of the draw or is there a way to kind of get things like, like, yeah. So how is the fruit flavor created? Yeah, it really is a function of a couple of things. One part of it is the varietal itself, right? So for instance, for, uh, for white wines, right? If you've made a, a white wine out of, let's say Sauvignon Blanc, a lot of times you'll get citrus notes out of those wines, right? Because just by the very nature of the fruit itself. So you're gonna get pineapple, green apple, maybe some herbaceous, con uh, herbaceous uh, notes as well. The other part of it is going to be about the ripeness or how you're growing the grapes, right? So as an example, in the past, in the long past, Lodi was known for a lot of sort of overly ripe 
overly ripe Zinfandel getting turned into wine with high alcohol, sort of picked at a very high sugar content level. And so in those cases, you've got pruny flavors, right? Or raisiny flavors. And so, mm. you know, one part of it is going to be, again, the varietal. One part of it is going to be how you're growing, how you're growing and, and uh, using the grapes. Mm. Thank what you. What are the grapes used? I'm sorry? What are the grapes used? Uh, in this case, this is a, this rosé was 100% Zinfandel. Zinfandel, okay. Yes. Jason, Dan uh, also has a uh, question for you. Dan, Hirano. Um, thanks, James. Uh, Jason, I, uh, is this wine more recommended for drinking alone versus uh, having with food? And, and I ask that because some wines, upon initially tasting it, it has one kind of experience, but once you start eating, it kind of has another or mixed with the food. And so I think it, it changes the taste a little bit, does it not? Yeah, absolutely right. And in this case, um, this rosé, because of its high acid content and it, because it's a, it's a lighter style of a wine, it does go better with food. Uh, quite honestly, you know, some of our uh, reds later that we'll taste, they are bigger wines. And sometimes it really will depend upon what you're trying to pair the wines with. Yes. Um, so almost, I almost wish that Yuji was here because he could help with some of the pairing ideas. But as an example, our Zin, which is a bigger style wine, would, would go better with bigger meats as an example. Um, so for instance, you know, barbecue, et cetera, ribs uh, would, could be good. Uh, sometimes as well, you might have red wines that pair well with um, tomato. So a, a spicy tomato sauce, as an example, would be a good thing to pair with a, with a red wine. Whereas the rosé would be something definitely lighter in foods. And in fact, for Japanese food, the rosés would, would be a better, much better pair. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. So just I'll just go quickly over this slide. So this is um, this is the team. So our winemaker that uh, works with us, his name is Kian Tavakoli, has great experience having been a um, enologist at Opus One and one of the key winemakers for Claude Duval's uh, Cabernet program. And in fact, back, way back in 2014. Uh, we were recognized as being an artisan trailblazer out of Lodi. And so it was a real great start um, to our winery. So just to give a little bit of context here, and you'll hear more in a, in a couple slides, our first vintage was in 2008, where we made roughly around 50 cases of wine. And right now we're producing another, basically still a small amount, only about 400 cases of wine a year. Um, and, but we'll get into that a little bit more. And then also our other partner uh, in our team is Mike Manna, who's a uh, well-respected uh, vineyard manager in the Lodi area. He manages over 2,000 acres uh, and so has a real great understanding of the, the terroir and the, the landscape in Lodi and the soils to really help us produce the, um, the best wine grapes that we can. So where is Lodi? I'm pretty sure most of you know where Lodi is, but just in case, you know, Lodi is roughly from JSA, an hour and a half away, you know, uh, to the east. Uh, and, but I often uh, use this map to describe why Lodi is um, so well known for wine and wine grapes. And the primary reason, um, one of the primary reasons is because of this channel here, which is for those that have lived here a long time, this is the Carquinas Straits. And so the Carquinas Bridge is here. But this uh, inlet of the delta is what really allows um, the maritime breezes. So basically, you know, the uh, onshore breezes from the Pacific to actually pass through the Bay Area and get all the way to Lodi. And those cooling breezes is what allows the, the high temperature in Lodi during the summer to be, you know, 90 plus degrees. But in the evening, it, it'll drop back down all the way to the high 50s. And so that cooling of the bay breezes is really what helps the wine grapes develop and mature in a, in a really great way for, uh, for making wine. And so that's, um, that's Lodi. And I actually have a little trivia question here uh, for folks, which is this one. So I, I know that we have some ringers in the room probably with connections to the wine industry. So hopefully they won't give it away, but what is uh, Robert Mondavi, who most people know as one of the most famous California winemakers and winery owners out of Napa Valley, what is Robert Mondavi's connection to Lodi? Was it A, that he was born in Lodi? 
B, that he went C. to high school in Lodi. C, a. married a woman from Lodi. Or D, he also grew cherries in Lodi. So that is the poll. And I think what uh, Jill is doing now is he, she is putting up a way for you to actually vote. So let's see what, how people are voting. Oh, there's an all of the above uh, possibility as well. Wow, okay. This is so cool. Look at 31, 32 votes, We're almost there. Keep voting, keep voting people. All right, I'll let this go for a few more seconds. Okay. All right, well, the answer is B, actually. So Robert Mondavi went to high school in Lodi. So how this goes is that uh, when his, um, his parents first immigrated, or maybe it's grandparents, immigrated to the United States, they went via Minnesota, I believe, to Lodi. And uh, Robert Mondavi actually went to Lodi High School, uh, which is the same high school that I went to. And so uh, at the time when he lived in Lodi, his family was involved in the packing of grapes. And eventually Robert went to Stanford and after graduating uh, college at Stanford, went to Napa, continued in wine grapes and eventually became the icon for the wine industry that uh, he became. But uh, uh, in some way, shape or form, it started in Lodi, believe it or not, so. All right, oops. So let's see, how do I clear this or is it, uh, is it this? The poll results, Jill, do you know how I clear this off my screen or can anybody else see the poll or no? I cleared it. Maybe you have to. I'm not sure. Huh. Um, Click on it. Maybe Kevin, could you help me? Or how do I? Uh, do how I so I just see your slide. Oh, um, I see. Your trivia, the trivia time, the, the first slide. Um, oh, I the see. The poll came off the, the screen. Oh, OK. The poll. So the poll is still on my screen, actually. I think there's a, a click box where you can uh, close it. Oops. Let me try that again here. Wait. Uh, what are what are, can people see right now? Are they looking at me? Yes. Um, yeah, it's not uh, you're not sharing your screen anymore. Oh, that's weird. So I want to take this opportunity to mention, and this is called vamping for those of you <laughs> at home. Um, Jason has been so generous in actually donating all the wine for these tasting kits uh, to JC. And so all your wonderful um, donations that came in with the kits are, you know, 100% uh, going toward all the great programs um, and classes that we're able to offer uh, our community. And so, uh, you know, we, we are very grateful to Jason for not only his time, but also his generosity um, with us. Thank you, Jason. Oh, no, no problem. It was my pleasure. Thank you for that, uh, Kevin. I think hopefully you. everybody can see my screen again here. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I just wanted to throw out here again. So if you look at this table, basically what this is showing is the temperature uh, in Lodi over the, over the course of a year. And as I mentioned before about the maritime breezes and the delta breezes, you can see here during the summertime of July, August, and September, right? So the average, the average temperature is, you know, high 80s into the 90s. But again, in the evenings and at, at nighttime, the temperature drops down to like 57 degrees, right? So you almost have a, a 30 to 35 degree uh, wow. drop in temperature in Lodi. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a nice place to live because it doesn't stay hot and sticky the entire time. You actually get, uh, get it to cool down quite a bit. So I know most of the audience here is Japanese American. So this timeline probably is um, is, is well known, but just in case, as a quick reminder, uh, you know, in talking about my family, it, um, 
you know, my grandfather came here in the late 1800s, but in general, right, the late 1800s is the time when uh, the Japanese are immigrating to the US. Um, the 1869, you have the, the Wakamatsu Tea and Silk Form Colony in Placerville getting established. And then you have, you know, moving forward all the way through 1924, you've got various, various laws, unfortunately, uh, trying to exclude, uh, exclude Asians. And how this relates to um, my personal journey is that um, my grandfather, and, and this is somewhat uh, interesting, tomorrow, April 24th, uh, will be the 125th anniversary of him um, uh, immigrating to the US. And so this is definitely hard to see, but this is the actual manifest of the SS Tacoma, um, the boat that he was on that was going to sail from Yokohama to, uh, to Washington. And the thing here about my grandfather is that he was 14 years, 11 months old at the time that he immigrated to the U.S. And um, he was by himself, actually. And so it's, uh, it's crazy to think about how, you know, 125 years ago tomorrow, my grandfather uh, would have, you know, uh, boarded a ship at the age of 14 years old to, uh, to make a new life in a different country across the Pacific. So very, very crazy. Um, so what did that time frame look like in Lodi? So in, in Lodi at the time, right, uh, if you look on the left-hand side, uh, there's only about a thousand people, a couple thousand people living in Lodi at the time. And looking at census records in 1902, on the right side now, in 1902, there's only 50 Japanese in Lodi. And uh, so it's, a, it's a, again, a hard thing to believe that a 14 year old, and at that point, that would have been a 20 year old, um, single man from Japan would be living in Lodi amongst uh, 50 other Japanese people. Um, one thing to note about Lodi is uh, during the early 20th century when prohibition came around in 1920, Lodi actually gained quite a bit of notoriety because, because of its grape growing history. So after prohibition kicked in where you were no longer, you know, you, you, can't, um, you can't purchase uh, commercially made alcohol, the law still allowed people to make homemade wine. And so what Lodi was known for was basically these boxes. So you would have packed boxes of grapes that would be shipped from Lodi to primarily the, bat, to, to the East Coast uh, for immigrants, Italian, German uh, families that wanted to make wine. And so Lodi became known even at that point as a wine grape source. And then obviously in 1933, um, uh, prohibition was repealed, but Lodi continued to stay, uh, stay uh, a part of the, the wine grape growing uh, industry. And so again, for me, this is a family picture from roughly speaking 1925, 26-ish or so. And so this is my grandfather here, the person holding the, the baby. And then this is actually my father here next to him, um, uh, Jim Mikami. Uh, and so he was born in 1920. And so if you think about now, as he's growing up in 1930, he's 10 years old, there's about 150 Japanese families. And in 1940, there's about 800 Japanese living in Lodi, at which point, as many of you guys probably know, then it was time for internment. And so um, I thought what I thought I'd do, because I know everybody's drinking and eating, et cetera, I thought that we could pause here for maybe just a, two minutes to give folks a quick um, opportunity to take a bio break if need be. And then we can just pick up right after this and we'll start drinking our second wine. Mm, interesting. In the meantime, if anybody else has questions along the way, I'm happy to, I'm happy to uh, answer questions as well. Did you ever hear stories about your grandfather, um, like traveling by himself to the U.S., like you know, kind of trickling down through, you know, your parents or something? Like, oh yeah, he kind of talks, you know, any kind of weird stories or like how hard it was to be by yourself during that time. You know, it's so sad. No, 
Um, the only thing that I know is that, you know, later on, he went back to Japan uh, mm. and then married and then came back with my grandmother. Mm. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's really one of those, you know, sad things where unfortunately none of those stories made it through. Jason, when you, when you showed the, uh, the uh, ship's uh, document, and I noticed it said that your grandfather came over on the SS Tacoma. Yeah. From Yokohama. And that's that's where my mom shipped out of too. Oh really? But but where did what what was their destination? Was it LA or Seattle? I'm not pretty sure. I'm pretty sure this one the destination was Washington, I think. Oh no. Okay. Oh in the manifest, his destination is listed as uh, Kent, Washington. Washington. So I, I think this the ship would have went to Washington, I believe, but uh, I'm, yeah. I could be wrong. No, I think that sounds right. Uh, and just FYI, for those that are interested, um, you know, I was able to find this document by just going to uh, one of those genealogy sites and just not even having to pay. There are some sites now where you can access these types of public records just straight online. Uh, and that's how I was able to actually find this. Oh, great. Yeah. All right. Why don't we go ahead and, and keep going here now um, and start talking about our second wine. So if you have your second wine poured, uh, this, is, this will be our Petite Syrah. So one thing I should probably uh, let folks know is that uh, as an example, actually, let me just go back for a quick second. So the first wine we drank, right, was a 2020 rosé. So for, for those who may not know, rosés are typically um, harvested, crushed, and then uh, bottled for wine all within uh, a four to five, maybe five months time period. So in this case, you know, we would have harvested the Zinfandel in September. Uh, that would have then... Um, uh, been crushed and um, starting the fermentation process right then and there. And then we would have bottled this rosé sometime in the March timeframe of this year. And actually, um, you know, you guys are all drinking it now. Now, in the case of red wines, the timeline is, is much longer. So as an example, this Petit Syrah that you're drinking now was actually harvested in 2018. That's why this is our 2018 Syrah. So the 2018 Syrah is harvested on October the 16th. And then this in fact gets, um, gets uh, crushed and fermented, but then uh, aged in barrels for much longer. Uh, in this case, uh, the barrel aging um, was 20 months. And uh, in this case, we are actually barreling in 33% uh, new French oak. Uh, and so to the earlier question about the influences of barrels, et cetera, in terms of the flavors, in this case, the French, uh, French barrels will add some additional, um, in some cases, vanilla, again, potentially some level of uh, oaky smoke type uh, influences into the wine. Uh, and going back to our sight, smell, and taste uh, areas, this, you know, this is a much deeper, uh, deeper colored wine. In fact, Petit Syrah is one of the, the most purple of uh, wines that you can uh, make. So this, in this case, this is deep purple and red. Um, and when you drink this, obviously you're gonna taste a, a much larger difference in terms of the mouth feel and the finish uh, relative to the uh, rosé we drank earlier. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's the Petit Syrah. I see in the chat that um, Fuzzy is actually asking about how much your rosé is. It sounds like it's found a new uh, fan out here. Um, <laughs> and perhaps it's uh, now's a good time to mention how uh, Jason's wines aren't really sold uh, in stores uh, right now. That um, And Jason, can you tell everybody um, what the best way is, uh, you know, if there's a particular type um, that they've enjoyed today where they can get more? Yeah, sure. So the best way is to actually, well, in this case, we're all, we're all, we're all family now, but uh, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter group by providing me your email address or by going to our website, mikamivineyards.com and signing up for our newsletter. And then the, the, 
The process for ordering is pretty simple. You let me know and then I ship it to you. Uh, and uh, again, because we as a winery right now are still so small in production, we really do like to get to know each and every one of our customers. And so just emailing me is the right way to do that. And then in terms of the cost for the wines, uh, the rosé that we had a little bit ago is $29 per bottle. Uh, and the Petit Syrah that you're drinking right now is 35. And the Zin that we'll finish up with is 39. And so, um, you know, we ship, uh, we ship uh, direct to consumer here in California. So if you let me know um, the quantity and types of wines you're looking for, then I can ship them to you. Alrighty. So let's keep going uh, in terms of the presentation. Uh, so yeah, so we left off talking about all the way through the 1940s, right? So now my dad is 20 years old or actually by the time of internment, he is 21, 21, 22 years old. And so then for folks in Lodi in the, in the Japanese American sort of legacy of going to camp, um, Lodi went all the way to Arkansas. Um, they went all the way to Rower, Arkansas. Uh, and what's really interesting here is that I mentioned my wife Mitzi earlier, her family didn't live too far from Lodi. Her family uh, was located in French camp and Stockton. However, uh, the French camp folks, which were very close to Stockton, the French camp folks went to somewhere completely different. And I, I actually don't recall where, which camp uh, her mom went to. But for whatever reason, even though they were only separated by maybe 15, 20 miles, they went to a different camp and the Lodi and Stockton folks went all the way out to Arkansas. And then in Arkansas, well, actually a quick story about, um, about uh, internment. Gila. Uh, Mitzi's telling me that her parents, uh, her mom went to Gila from French camp. <laughs> from French camp. But, um, so the story here is that, uh, you know, as the Japanese Americans had to um, give up a lot of their uh, possessions in order to um, go to camp, uh, the one story that I do remember about from my father is how um, the family was very excited that they were able to buy a brand new car uh, only a few months later to have to basically sell that car. And so um, on the left here, what you'll see is a scan of something that I found recently uh, after my parents uh, passed on. Um, I was you know, going through the, the house and lo and behold, here is the registration and the bill of sale for the car that they bought in 1941, in June, June 28th of 1941. And then obviously camp uh, and internment begins, I think in May of 1942. And so this is the car that uh, he was telling about. And that, this is actually a picture of my dad, uh, dad in camp. And so that's a sad story. But after camp, they, uh, they did go back to Lodi. And so my grandfather on the left here, you can see him pruning some grapes. And this is my dad on the right. So the family did move back to uh, Lodi um, to restart uh, the grape growing uh, tradition. And uh, luckily for my grandfather uh, and father, they were able to buy property in the early 50s. And um, they, my aunt actually still lives on that, uh, on that vineyard. Um, and um, the, uh, eventually, and I'll show you some pictures in a second, eventually my dad will get his own vineyard, but the family continues to grow grapes um, after camp. Uh, all, and that tradition continues obviously all the way through, through now. And one thing to note is Mitzi's family, um, just to bring up a different uh, angle of Japanese American um, history here is in her case, um, her family after camp went east actually to Seabrook Farms, New Jersey, uh, which a lot of uh, folks don't know, but um, during this time post-war, um, post uh, the food industry is looking for labor. Um, and in fact, a lot of Jamaicans for whatever reason are actually, and Caribbeans are actually brought to Seabrook, New Jersey as well. And Mitzi's family uh, is working for Seabrook Farms to actually make uh, frozen foods or canned foods at the time. And so kind of an interesting little trivia tidbit there. 
And then just a, a little bit more about, you know, our family history. Um, you know, I had a father or uh, had an uncle who served in the 442nd and had a relative who unfortunately was killed um, uh, serving with the 442nd, but was uh, posthumously recognized uh, by President Bill Clinton uh, with the uh, Medal of Honor uh, way back in, I think it must have been around 1998. Uh, and strangely enough, um, my family history in my my family history and the Japanese American experience here is kind of complex in the sense that uh, my dad was interned uh, and his family was interned and moved to Arkansas. But my mom, my mom is actually from Hiroshima. <laughs> and uh, so uh, she unfortunately was a survivor of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. And so um, she suffered uh, burns on her neck and back and, um, you know, her, the story uh, of her time during uh, the atomic bomb was she heard the air sirens, she was up on the second story of her house, uh, and then she turned around, and then all of a sudden there was a flash of light, and then she uh, woke up under the rubble of her second floor on top of her, and then um, she had to make her way to find help, and that was her experience with, uh, with the war. So very complex with uh, father's side being interned, Mother side being <laughs> being uh, dropped on by the atomic bomb, so very crazy, crazy experience. Um, but through it all, uh, my mom and dad end up getting married through an arranged marriage uh, in 1958, and uh, that's when uh, my mom comes to the United States. And um, from the United States, or from uh, from Japan. Um, they, they're part of my dad's family at the other vineyard that I mentioned a second ago. Um, but in 1963, my father purchases this vineyard here that you see in this picture. And this is actually the vineyard that I grew up on. And so the, the wines that you're drinking tonight are actually from this vineyard. It's a, it's a 15 acre, it's, oops, it's a 15 acre vineyard, um, that you see here now on the right. And, um, what, uh, what we're dedicating right now to our family label wines is this uh, small block of uh, vines here uh, noted in the oval shape. It's roughly about five to five, eight percent of the vineyard. And that's what we're using right now to source the wines that you're drinking. So the rosé, the petit Syrah, the Zinfandel is all coming from this section of the vineyard. And right now the rest of the vineyard is actually um, the fruit is sold to other wineries. And so what we do with the, the, the block of uh, vines that we're using for our wines, you know, we, we really, you know, almost treat these as completely separate from the rest of the vineyard where these are all being uh, hand pruned, hand thinned, hand picked. Uh, and really we're trying to manage very carefully the load of the fruit load on the vines to make sure that we can uh, make the best possible wine uh, out of the out of these grapes. So and that's what's um, that's, that's what you're seeing here. And then just one more picture of Lodi. So this is what Lodi looks like today. This is our famous Lodi Arch. And so uh, the uh, the main landmark of Lodi these days, the Lodi Arch. So um, any questions about uh, about this section of the the journey and the story? You know, Jason, uh, Mari actually had a question regarding um, some of the the environmental stuff that's been going on um, out there recently. Mari? Oh, well, her, her okay, question was regard. Know. Oh, there you go. I don't you know go. if you can hear me. I'm yes. calling in from Mexico, so I may pull out, but I just wondered how the uh, wildfires affected your production last year, your growing in your production, because I noticed you did 20 cases of rosé. I thought you usually did more than that. Maybe I'm mistaken, but no. it seemed like a low number. Yeah, it is uh, lower than our normal. Hi, Mari. How are you? Um, so Hi. luckily, Lodi was spared um, from the um, smoke of the Napa fires. There were days where you had some some smoke enter the Lodi area, but not enough to taint the grapes. So luckily, uh, for the most part, Lodi was completely spared of all the wildfires. Any other questions? 
know, uh, Margie actually had a question, uh, a general question about um, some uh, some uh, storage uh, about storage and everything. Margie. Uh, yeah, this is Margie's husband, Dick. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm really enjoying the uh, the wine. Um, just wanted to know, uh, how long could uh, these wines be stored? Uh, could you put them away for five years, 10 years, just a couple of years? And I'm particularly, if you could speak to the rosé, which I thought was uh, amazingly excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Dick. I appreciate that. Um, the rosés typically you're you're going to want to drink fairly quickly, um, probably in a in a year or so. Um, it is meant to be consumed uh, fairly quickly. Uh, not to say that it necessarily go bad beyond that time per se, but uh, to retain a lot of the acidity and the freshness of those uh, those vibrant fruits, you'll want to drink it fairly quickly. The red wine, especially our Zin, can la uh, can be laid down or aged for for five, six, seven years. Um, one of the things to note though is there are other wines, um, typically Cabernet Sauvignon, et cetera, that, that can be aged for even further, but we recommend our Zin and our Petit Syrah to be, to be had sometime in between, you know, say now through seven years or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, any other questions on the chat, Kevin? If not, I'll just keep moving on here. All right. So lastly, just to give a sense for kind of Lodi today, um, you know, interesting 8%, um, 9% of uh, Lodi um, Asian. Um, now put that in context though, in terms of Japanese Americans, the number is pretty small, even in Lodi. Um, and if you put that in the context of the rest of the US today, right, um, um, we're, we're uh, somewhat of a slowly diminishing uh, group of Asian Americans here. Uh, of the total US population, only 0.4% of the US population is actually Japanese American with only about 272,000 living in California now. So um, definitely uh, dwindling. Um, so um, I know um, Jill's friend and my, my, my new friend, uh, Ken is on the line, but uh, there's not a lot of Japanese Americans actually in the wine business. So. I feel fortunate and honored to, tr to be able to try and keep up the, both the farming and the, the wine tradition out of Lodi and sort of representing the Japanese American community because there's not many people. Um, and, and Ken, the person that I'm mentioning right now is actually in the wine industry and we're actually trying to build a little group of Nikkei, uh, Nikkei folks to, um, to find more Japanese Americans that are actually in the business. So, um, it's a, it's a small coterie of, uh, of people at this point. So we're about 45 minutes in. So I thought I'd give another quick two minute uh, intermission for folks um, to again, stand up and stretch or take a bio break as we prepare for the last segment of our talk and we'll drink our third wine next, which is, which is our Zinfandel, so. In the meantime, if people have questions, feel free to ask more questions too. Jason, um, just looking at uh, the finished product, uh, we see a lot of wines now with a metal cap on it instead of a cork. Is, is that what we should be expecting from now on? And is there any difference in the, how it preserves a wine? Yeah, you know, there's, there's different schools of thought. Um, you know, going with cork is very much the, the classic choice um, that is, so I'll tell you a funny story. Um, our winemaker, because of his experience at uh, Opus One and Clos de Val, and, you know, being part of really, you know, very famous brands, I've often suggested that maybe for different reasons, maybe we should not have a capsule even. Some, some wines now you'll see, they don't even have capsules, the foil that's sitting on top of the, um, on, the, on top of the bottle, because for different reasons, it could be for uh, green reasons, could be for money reasons, maybe, hey, let's just not have the capsules. But for Keon, our winemaker, he says that basically the bottle is naked if you do that, it is not a finished product. And in many, in many cases, like not using cork would also imply a not elegant finished product. 
And so for our brand and label today, we continue to use cork and we continue to have full capsules on our bottles. Now, in terms of preservation itself, in, in some ways, a screw cap actually preserves the wine in some ways better, if you will, in the sense that it really seals it. But there will be others who say that the microscopic uh, pores in cork that allow a very small amount of oxygen to get into the wine is actually beneficial for the long-term aging and development of the wine flavors. And so there's different schools, uh, schools of thought on that. Wow, great, thank you. Hi, Jason, Jason I have a question. Uh, this is Marion Cooey, uh, but my grandparents, uh, last name was Hirabara. They lived in a campo. And they uh -huh. grew wines through after the war uh, through I think sixty two maybe. Wow! And so there are Japanese that were involved with the wine business. He um, he uh, my grandfather was the manager of this grape ranch. Uh huh. And Bruce Davini owned it. Huh. Okay. Yeah. And they and they loved and they my, my mother remembers writing the letter from the Buddhist hostel in Florin, trying to find a place for her, her, her agricultural parents to be able to work. And she wrote to Bruce Davini and, the, and he hired him to manage the ranch for him. Wow. So they named my brother Bruce, <laughs> because, wow. of Bruce because of Bruce Davini. So I don't know if he's still, or his family's still involved with, but he owned the land. Wow. Uh, I'll have to look that up. If you tell me this, the spelling of the last yeah. note. I'll okay. I'll, I'll check with my brother to make sure I have the spelling right, but yeah, I'll get you that. And I, you know, we've driven by there and, you know, there's beautiful, now there's wine estates. It looks like, I mean, yeah. it looks like yeah. a TV show. It's very wealthy looking, but we used to have an Ofuro there <laughs> and uh, we play in the, the, the ditches. Yeah. And there was a lot of sand. And then the railroad tracks went right at the far end of the grapes. There was the railroad tracks. And uh, and did you live there, did you say? Or? Uh, uh, during the summer, we would go oh, okay, there. Gotcha. And we yeah. spent lots of time there. It was wonderful. It was uh, you know, just an outdoor farm experience. And they had yeah. some horrible chickens. <laughs> your, your family probably knew the Koyama family out of Acampo, probably. They live right near the railroad tracks. But, uh, ah, okay. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I, my mom used to, actually, she used to take such pride in her being able to pick the grapes without taking the blush off. Uh-huh. Yeah, and that was the, you know, she, that's where she got a lot of pride, where she could pack a whole box and it was just beautiful. Now, I think they grew mostly toke. Yeah. Table grapes. All right. Back then, yeah. it would be okay. Yeah, that... and then and then we also used to go to the I think the grape festival was that in Lodi. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, That's right. yeah, that was fun. And then <laughs> back then there was a big Japanese population because they had JSCL picnics. That's right. And they were very. They were. I mean, there were a lot of Japanese there. So I don't know what happened to them all. Did they go to Stockton or something? <laughs> they moved to the Bay Area and other places, kind of, kind of like me, unfortunately. So. Yeah, wow. Because I always think of Lodi as plenty of Japanese people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Definitely dwindling now. Yeah, wow. That's a little scary, actually, looking the, at the, the demographics. So. All right. Well, thank you for that. And so yeah. uh, well, well, why don't we go you. ahead and move on to our third okay. and final segment of this thing. Um, so the last wine that we're drinking is our 2018 Zinfandel. And I actually uh, heard, heard someone talking about this earlier, but yes, this is our award-winning Zinfandel recently uh, awarded best of class in the San Francisco Chronicle wine competition. Uh, something we're very honored and humbled by. When you get designated as best of class, it basically means that the entire panel of judges thought that this was the best Zinfandel in its category. And so, um, We've had a lot of, uh, this, is our, this is our flagship wine in the sense that we started making wine in 2008. And when we first started making wine, it was Zinfandel. Uh, the primary decision around that was due to the fact that A, Lodi was well known for Zinfandel. B, the climate is suited for Zinfandel. And so as we wanted to start our brand, we wanted to go ahead and launch with Zinfandel first. And so that, our, again, our first vintage was 2008. So this is our 11th release of this wine. Uh, and we make about, you know, as it says here, about 210 cases of this. 
this one is deep red in color. Uh, now you're getting more darker fruit, um, fruit um, aromas and tastes out of this wine rather than the bright cherry uh, and strawberry uh, raspberry notes that you had in the rosé. Now you're actually getting black cherry, you're getting um, uh, more dried herbs, that type of uh, that type of flavoring. So going back to the question that uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but the question of how do you get different flavors out of the the grapes or the wine? Here's a good example, right? So the rosé, 100% Zinfandel, in the way that it's produced and made, you're getting uh, cherry and and raspberries. Now you're looking at a red wine made out of Zinfandel and you're getting black cherries, dried herbs, maybe a little bit more, again, darker fruit, uh, fruit notes. Um, this wine, I, I believe, was a, is 93% Zinfandel and, uh, or I'm sorry, 97% Zinfandel and 3% uh, Petit Syrah. And the Petit, oops, the Petit Syrah is uh, also, uh, well, you tasted it. It's, it's also from our, our, our vineyard as well. All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and move on to just a quick, uh, quick tour of uh, viticulture in terms of, you know, growing grapes and starting with um, the, the vine itself and then moving all the way to crush. And then we can take some final questions at the end. So in terms of grape growing, right? It all starts with, it all starts with the vine itself, right? And just like a normal tree, right? You have a, a root system, you have your trunk. And in the case of uh, grapevines, they're actually trained. And similar to this, uh, our vines are trained as well. And the vines are trained to actually have what's either called cordons or arms. Think of them as arms, just like our own arms. They, they branch uh, horizontally out from the trunk uh, that allows for uh, easy management of the vines. Uh, oftentimes, you know, those uh, arms are on trellises, wires that allow the, the grapes to continue or the vine to continue to grow on the, on the training system. And from those arms come up what are effectively are the, 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 the shoots or the canes that the grape bunches will actually grow on over time. And so we'll go through kind of the life cycle in a second, but this is the, pri the primary uh, anatomy of a, of a grapevine. One thing to note is that uh, a lot of times what you'll see is that while the, the bottom portion of the root system may be of one variety, you might have different varieties on the top of that same root system. So in the case of uh, for instance, at our vineyard, we have a root system where we've grafted uh, Zen. In some cases, you might have um, another root system and you have Petit Syrah, or you might have another, uh, another variety of grape uh, grafted onto a particular root system. And way back when, the primary reason for that is they learned that certain root systems were better at preventing some type of disease or, they, or they're not you know, fond uh, or they're not uh, uh, liked by certain pests. And so um, the root system is chosen specifically to avoid either disease or pests. And then you grow the variety you want on top of that root system. All right, so here's the growing season. So um, you know, back three months ago, uh, we'll go through what's known as pruning. Um, and then in March, uh, actually more like right now. So this is, I need to move this over to the right. But right now, in fact, right after this presentation tonight, I am heading back to Lodi to, uh, to do uh, shoot thinning, which is a way that we can manage the amount of fruit actually growing on the, the grapevines. And then we will go through an effort to later in the, in the spring to reduce the number of actual grape bunches on the vine. Again, all in an effort to manage the amount of fruit growing on the, the vine. And so you may be asking the question, why do we manage or reduce all of this fruit that's growing on the grapevine? It's all uh, for the benefit of making wine. We want to ensure that the, that the vine is spending its um, energy and resources and producing the, the best grapes possible. So we'll do everything possible to, to, to manage that, including dropping uh, too much fruit. And we'll get into that in a second as well. And then we'll get into a little bit of what we call canopy management, cluster thinning, 
and then eventually uh, harvesting of the grapes. So jumping in really quickly, uh, pruning. So in terms of pruning, uh, what, what's done here is to really help um, set up the grapevine for success, um, both from the standpoint of the number of shoots and eventual clusters that you're going to grow, but also uh, from the standpoint of being able to more easily manage the leaves, the shoots, uh, the position of the bunches that you're going to have to pick later on, uh, how much air and uh, airflow you want going flowing through the, the grapevine itself. All of that is really being determined here at the time when the grapes are, when the vines are dormant. So you're going to, you're going to prune a certain specific way to allow um, the vines to uh, grow in a certain way. And um, one thing to note here is something called the spur. These spurs are what, where you will manage the number of shoots that actually come up from each of these spurs. And so um, figuring out where you're gonna position these spurs uh, will dictate uh, how easily you'll be able to manage the shoots and the grapes that eventually grow off from these spurs. And then just recently, back in late March, uh, after the vines are pruned, right, you'll see here, you can see at the top here, this is where the vine, uh, the previous year's shoot was cut off. And also here, where you're left with basically this spur that has these two buds. And from these two buds, and in, in the case of this year, I think it was March 24th or something like that, spring comes. And this is where the new uh, shoots will start to emerge from these buds. And we call that process bud break. And so bud break occurred on March 24th. And this is where the shoots will now start to emerge. And in fact, that's where we get into the next phase, which is this shoot thinning. So from each of those buds, this will be the eventual, um, eventual shoot and cane that develops from each of those buds. And so you've got you know, this primary shoot You've got leaves that will grow on, you know, sort of opposite sides of each other. So one leaf here, one leaf here, one leaf here, and then you'll have the bunches of grapes developing off of this shoot. And so from our perspective, when we're growing these, um, these vines, we look to really manage the vines in such a way where on each of these spurs, there's only two shoots actually gener uh, being grown off of each spur. And we actually manage the, the shoots to make sure that there's only two, maybe one or at the most two grape clusters for each of these shoots. And so when we were talking earlier about shoot thinning and canopy management and things like that, that's what you're seeing here, which is on the left-hand side, if you let the vines grow on its own, it may produce a lot of vegetation, might produce a lot of leaves that might block the sun, it might, um, it might uh, block air from being able to flow through the, the, the grapevine itself. So you actually go through and proactively remove leaves, you're removing, you're removing uh, any extra shoots that are happening, that are forming on the, on the vine itself, and you're reducing all of this extra stuff that you don't want the vine to focus on. And then with that, continuing on, we're actually now doing what's known as cluster thinning. So with cluster thinning, what you can see here is that early on in the, in the growing cycle, after the clusters are formed, if there's too many clusters, you're dropping fruit and you're actually um, low, uh, lessening the amount of grapes that the vine actually needs to focus on. And so a lot of times people ask, well, isn't that a waste of, all of these grapes? And the answer is sort of yes, but if you're trying to really produce uh, high quality wine, you're trying to really manage the amount of, uh, of fruit. Uh, and in particular, this gets into a lot of detail, but you're also trying to manage the amount of berries uh, versus juice that you're eventually going to, to harvest. And so it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, careful practice of figuring out how many grapes you're actually going to, going to harvest. And then, uh, as mentioned before, again, going through canopy management. So even after all of the shoot thinning that we talked about before, you know, the grapevine can be very vigorous, right? Grapevines are very, uh, they, they like to grow. And so you, you'll need to continue to manage the, the canopy, all of the leaves. And so this is what it could be, but, you know, instead what you want is uh, something much more open where you can see 
see the grapes, have air flowing through the, the, the grape bunches. Um, and the primary reason why you want the airflow is you don't want, you don't want things like mildew or mold growing in the grapes. So you're looking for to control that naturally by having a good airflow through the bunches itself. And then eventually in the July-ish timeframe, the grapes will actually start to turn color from the green that we saw earlier to the, the normal purple or dark purple grapes that you'll, you'll often see for, for red wine. And that whole process is called uh, veraison. And veraison is uh, this, this conversion from green to colored, colored grapes. And then again, <laughs> because the grapes are vigorous, right? Along the way, you're still figuring out, okay, which bunches do we really want? Which are, which are gonna be the best um, grapes um, to, to use for making the wine? And so you're continuing to go through the, the vineyard and you're identifying stuff that you want to drop. And that way you get better consistency, better, um, better um, um, more balanced uh, bunches. The flavor profile is gonna be more balanced. Uh, and so you're just continuing to, to, to manage, the, manage the load on the vine itself. And then finally, you get to the point where lo and behold, the grapes are finally ripe uh, and you're looking for the right flavor profile, both from a standpoint of sugar, but also acidity as well. And so you're, you're trying to find that, that, that right uh, point in time where you have the right balance of flavor, sugars, acidity, and you're going to harvest. And then what does harvest look like? Harvest looks like this. So each you know, September or October, depending upon how the harvest year is going, you're waking up at the crack of dawn to pick the grapes while it's very cool. Uh, you don't wanna pick the grapes when it's, when it's warm because as soon as you um, pick the grapes, all of those sugars uh, potentially are getting converted, right? You're going to have this natural, uh, spontaneous fermentation start to happen if things are too hot. And so you're looking to, to pick the grapes at, at, the, at a very cool time. And so what that basically means is that you're picking at the crack of dawn. And in some cases these days in the grape industry, a lot of people are using mechanical harvesters. And so for mechanical harvesters, they actually just go through the vineyard at the deep, deep of night, even um, midnight, 1 a.m. in the morning, you'll oftentimes in Lodi hear mechanical harvesters going through the vineyards and actually harvesting the, the grapes. So let me stop Jason. there. Again, a lot, of, a lot of information there. And I'm sorry that I'm going so quickly, but I wanted to make sure I kind of got through all that. Jason, um, for someone like me, who has just had desk jobs all his life, this sounds like a lot of work on 15 acres. Can you um, kind of put that in perspective of like what it actually, the amount of work that it takes to kind of work your vineyard and then um, kind of put it also in the context of when your dad was uh, running the vineyard? Yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting thing. 15 acres, you know, for most people sounds like a lot. In farming, it's not so much and um, it's, it's somewhat sad to say this, but the 15 acres for almost, you know, from 1963 when my dad bought the property until about 2000 when he started to really be too old to take care of it, he actually managed the 15 acres almost by himself. He pruned every single vine on his own. He irrigated and tractored on his own. And, but that's unfortunate because we, re we really didn't have the scale where like he had a crew or had you know had uh, somebody else able to farm and do the tractoring and the irrigation is because we were too small, and so the amount of effort is actually very high if you have to do it all by yourself. Now that's why we actually employ a vineyard manager who has the economies of scale of having a larger crew, having equipment to do like the pre pruning. Um, uh, having, you know, the, the capital to be able to set up drip, a uh, drip irrigation system, you know, back in my dad's day, um, you know, he's using a tractor to dig ditches to, to, and then he'd have to walk the vineyard to make sure that all the, the ditches were being irrigated properly and things like that. And so, um, it is a, it is about economies of scale. Now for my involvement, right. 
for that block of wine or block of vines that we're using for the wines that we're making, it is, you know, myself, Mitzi, and, you know, now Kate as well, you know, will go out and hand prune sometimes and hand, um, hand shoot thin, you know, will help out with harvest, etc. And it's a lot of work, um, you know, and this is where, um, you know, it's hard to always hear about the macro topics of immigration and, you know, all the stuff that we had through the Trump times, etc. cetera, um, because a lot of the, you know, the immigrant workers today, especially the Hispanics and the Latin Americans, their, you know, their story of working in the vineyard is no different than my dad and my grandfather. And so it's, you know, we, uh, it's a lot of work and, um, you know, we need to, we need to value the immigrant population that actually comes to do the hard labor that it is, um, in farming. I kind of went off on a tangent a little bit, Kevin, sorry, I didn't quite answer exactly your question, but, uh, hopefully that. No, I mean, I think it really does. It's a, it's amazing that, um, you know, all the, um, this great bounty that we enjoy, uh, I mean, that comes from, you know, a lot of hard work that's put into the land. Yeah. All right. Um, that's, going that's, back, uh, oh, yes. going just, I just want to hit a couple of things. Um, going back, there's a couple of people who had questions, um, yeah, including uh, Alan from, uh, this is actually going a little bit uh, from several slides ago, but um, Alan, can you ask your question? I think my question was, when you say best of class, does that mean that smaller wineries have their own class and the larger wineries have their own class? I mean, do you compete with the big name brand kind of Mondavi and that kind of thing? Yeah, it really depends. In this particular competition, it's, it's all large and small. And so in this case, the class that was defined for us was... Uh, Zinfandel is the variety and within a certain price range. And this price range, I think, was something between like $30 and $45 or something of that nature. So in that category of Zinfandel in a certain price range for all out of all of those entrants, regardless of small or big, wow. yeah, we were fortunate enough for the judges to pick this one as the best of class. Wow. <laughs> also, um, Margie or Dick had a question as well. Yeah, there I'm unmuted. Yeah, I, I just, I, you, you ran through this earlier, but uh, I kind of missed it. Uh, just the alcohol by volume of, of the three wines that we tasted tonight. Yes. So the rosé, uh, again, uh, as a stylistic choice, we kind of have it on a slightly higher scale for a rosé. It's 14, I think 14.8%, I believe, uh, for the rosé. Oh, okay. The petite is also 14.8, and the uh, Zen is 15. Okay, thank you. You know, also, um, our uh, executive director, Diane, had a question for you, too, regarding your winery. I am a real lightweight and turned bright red, so I can't drink that much. But this presentation is so fascinating, just from the history side, your family's involvement, and just the, the process and nature. But I was wondering, you know, everyone's talking about the drought and is there anything you can do to prepare for kind of having less water coming up this summer? So luckily in the Lodi area, we have a pretty healthy water table, meaning underground water. And so we actually uh, irrigate using a, uh, a, uh, a well or a pump that we have uh, on the property. So in the Lodi area is, is, is pretty fortunate. Uh, having said that, though, with the ongoing threat of climate change, you know, that water table is depleting. Uh, fortunately for Lodi, it's not depleting quite as much as some places in the further southern uh, Central Valley, where you're, you'll hear stories about now, you know, back in the 2010 to 2015 drought, you know, those, those areas were seeing the compaction of their soil by like two inches. Right, the, the actual physical ground is collapsing by by two inches or more in some cases. So luckily, uh, it's not that bad. Um, the other thing to note is that grapes are luckily are fairly drought tolerant, and so um, they don't. You know, you can you can get by with a little bit of uh, water, and we do employ drip irrigation so we can minimize the amount of water waste um, on the vineyard. And also, uh, Dan Hirano has. 
a question that um, I actually had talked to you a little bit before. Dan, can you ask your question? Uh, well, I'll ask it on behalf of Dan, because it was actually a loaded question I was going to ask you um, also, was, um, can you, is your wine actually available in Japan? Um, it is, uh, no, it is oh, not, sorry. although I, I can ship to Japan, so mm -hmm. I do have some customers in Japan. Um, what's funny is that uh, it's not available at a retail location, but it is in two restaurants in Japan through just personal connections that I have back in Japan. So it is in two restaurants, one in Tokyo and one in, uh, the, in Southern Japan, but uh, retail wise, no, but I can always ship uh, direct to consumer in Japan. From a um, wine industry perspective, do you have any um, uh, sense of how the Japanese wineries, you know, what they think of your wine coming from the, the you know, not, you know the, the United States? Yeah, you know, I think uh, we've, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, has a following, especially because it is, like you're saying, from California. So they do recognize that. The Japanese palates have not fully sort of um, gotten to the same point as the US or Europe. So as a good example, like rosés, people don't really get rosés in Japan so far. Um, and so there's not much, uh, not much demand for rosés, but definitely for Zen, um, Cabernet Sauvignon, some of the more sort of well-known uh, varietals out of California are, definitely have, uh, have uh, recognition there. Okay, so Jason, uh, this is Dan again. I, 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 I didn't, I, I was muting myself, but I wanna compliment you on your presentation. It's been fantastic to learn about um, all the work you do to get the beautiful wines you have. But um, is 2021 turning out to be a good year for wine for you? Yeah, so far, I think, uh, yes, um, things, uh, things are really looking so far great. And in fact, again, as I mentioned, uh, I'll, we'll be um, shoot thinning here shortly. So I'll, I'll, I'll have a real intimate look at uh, how vigorous the vines are and kind of where the where we are in the whole life cycle for this year. So, uh, but things are, things are looking great. Um, you know, it, it's interesting going back again to the drought and tying it back to your question. Uh, you know, in some cases, you know, like 2015 was um, the last year of the drought or maybe the second to last year of the drought. Um, 2015 turned out to be one of our, you know, best vintages. A lot of people really enjoyed our 2015, partly because whether it was fully because of the drought or not, or just it happened to be the mother nature at the time, but the amount of fruit that the vines um, generated uh, in 2015 was a lot lower. And so you had a very concentrated um, grape uh, harvest that year and the wines turned out phenomenally. So, um, you know, one part of this is science, but the other part is definitely art as it relates to mother nature and figuring out like what's, what's gonna happen and that's a complete unknown. Thank you. Now, Robin had a question in the small world department. Robin? So Robin was asking um, how you found um, <laughs> Ike Mana. Um, she said I, that it's my husband. Ah. It's my husband. Actually, it's uh, it's uh, I'm it's Glenn Fujinaka. Mike Nana and I grew up together in Lodi. I went to Lodi High School and graduated oh. in '59. So Mike was quite a partier. We were on the same baseball team for many many years. So uh, so uh, uh, I haven't seen him. I didn't go to my 50th reunion, so I probably missed him there. But I'm sure he was probably drunk that night. But anyway, <laughs> he's, he's quite a guy. He's still quite a partier. He's still quite yeah. a partier. You always see pictures yes. of him like in Cabo. Yes. Or... Yes. <laughs> but anyway, yes. Yeah, so you, you picked a good guy. He's quite a, a knowledgeable man. And uh, just, But how did you find out about him? I, I assume you contracted with him or somebody provided the name for you, his company? Yeah, again, just my, my dad, you know, having a 
was a grape grower as well. Yes. So he had a lot of connections. And so Mike, Mike knew of my dad. Mike also knew of my uncle who also grew grapes in Lodi. So there was a connection just through, you know, being grape growers in Lodi. Yes. Who's your uncle? My brother still farms in Lodi. My brother, Steve Fujinaka. Okay. And my, co my cousin is Leland Noma. Um, he does the, oh. he grows barbaric grapes and yeah. sells to uh, some oh, of the Jeremy. local uh, Jeremy Wines in Lodi. Yeah. So, well, I mean, um, there's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite a community. Some uh, or uh, other folks, folks are making wine out of Leland's grapes and actually doing vineyard designated uh, Noma wines, I believe. Yes. yes. Yeah. He's. I, I think they charge more than you, so you should raise your prices. I think. <laughs> 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 yes, but thank you very much. It was a great, uh, informative uh, um, lecture and, and presentation. And we're really uh, you're putting Lodi on the map in, in a very good way, which is very nice. Thank you for the from the from the. Japanese community in Lodi anyway thank you and I'm, I'm embarrassing my life so. thanks for the kind words and it was Glenn Fujinaka is that right I'll have to mention yes you, you ask Mike Nana you, you'll know well Dr. Glenn Fujinaka no just I'm sorry yeah I'm, I'm embarrassing my wife I'm I'm done but ask Mike about me he'll know I thank will. you I will. for sure, <laughs> for, sure. Yeah. for that all righty well, let me just quickly uh, end. Uh, we'll do one more poll uh, here to close off uh, everything. So which wine did you enjoy the most tonight? So this time I, now I'll know that you can't see the actual poll numbers climbing. So, uh, but maybe if Joel will put that up and maybe folks can vote for, for what wine you guys enjoyed the most tonight. This will help me with a little bit of market research. Although this time, oh, there it is, great. I see, I see the, the poll up and I see votes coming in. All right. I think we have a trend developing here. All right. More than half of you, more than half of you enjoy the Zinfandel the most. Second, as a close second, is the Rosé and the Petite Syrah was third. So thank you very much for that feedback. Really do appreciate it. Um, uh, uh, I mean, me just close by saying, um, if, if folks are interested, you know, please feel free to reach out, um, you know, on Facebook, Instagram, or at our um, website at mikamivineyards.com. Again, feel free to email me directly at jason at mikamivineyards.com as well. Uh, again, if you're interested in purchasing wines, learning more about our wines, learning more about our family even, feel free to contact me. So um, just wanna thank you everybody again for the time tonight. I know there was a lot of information and a lot of, uh, a lot of me talking. So hopefully you didn't get bored of my, my voice here, but uh, thank you no, again. No. And, oh, sorry, I, I have this thing that says, be sure to join to uh, win a prize. Unfortunately, I don't have a prize tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know what, I take that back. I can always do it afterwards. So if, if, if you guys join and mention this event tonight, you, you know what, I can still do a prize actually. So <laughs> what I can do is over the next, over the weekend, for everybody who joins our newsletter, I'll put everybody's name in a hat and I'll give somebody a prize. We can do that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Jason, we actually do have um, a few more questions that were in the chat, but before um, I want to open it up to um, perhaps uh, they can just ask you uh, themselves now as we're kind of made it to the end of your presentation. I did want to acknowledge um, Jill, uh, of course, in putting together this, uh, this um, program and like all the others, uh, you yeah, know, this would not be, uh, you know, possible without her great work. Um, also, Lisa Oyama and Sharon Umene, who, and also um, Ed Oda, uh, who helped assemble the wine kits that you guys are enjoying tonight. Wow. Um, and, you know, this entire presentation is really um, a part of our year-long celebration. You heard uh, earlier how um, Jason's, uh, well, Mitzi's grandmother, uh, was um, part of the JSA home down in Hayward. Um, and that's, I think, a reflection of how the JSA uh, roots kind of extend out through the community. And, uh, you know, we're celebrating our 50th year of JSA 
Um, and this is like a big part of it. So, um, you know, again, now, uh, if you have questions for, for Jason, I know that um, there have been some that are popping up in the, uh, in the chat, please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and let's just kind of uh, have a conversation here. Yeah, definitely. Jason, it's Mari again. Do you have any thoughts of offering tours of your winery? One day, yes, we, we, we hope to. Um, one of the things right now, we're just not really prepped for that. Um, the, the house that I grew up on is actually still on the property, but you know, since my parents are gone now, um, it's in need of some maintenance, but um, hopefully one day. Uh, the larger goal for us is ideally, you know, if I can get to the point where we're making about, you know, about 3000 cases of wine, maybe I can mm -hmm. be in this full time. And actually uh, at that point, uh, the goal would be to build a tasting room on the, on the venue. Mm -hmm. so ideally that would be awesome. And so kind of working, working towards that. JSA goal. Field Trip. Thank you. <laughs> Thank this you. is coming. This is Ben Takeshita. Hi Ben. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I, what I want to know is uh, I'm, I'm not a regular wine drinker. I drink at uh, meetings or conferences. So, um, but I'm used to more the white Zinfandel, which is sweeter, or the Merlot, which is sweeter. And I was wondering if you have some sweeter wines than the ones that you presented today. They're a little bit tart for me. Gotcha. Uh, no, unfortunately, right now, these are these are our three varietals. You know, having said that, you know, we are looking at potentially expanding our, our uh, portfolio of wines. Um, it's likely not that we'll focus mostly on, on sweeter wines, unfortunately, we'll, we'll probably stick more to the deeper uh, full bodied reds, although we are anticipating um, potentially adding a, 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 even a lighter style of rosé. I'm not sure if it'll necessarily be sweet. It'll be somewhat similar to the rosé you had tonight. Um, so unfortunately, the rosés would be the closest to what you're wanting, I think. Um, but uh, if, if tonight's didn't fit, uh, I'm not sure the other one will either. Thank you very much anyway. For very yeah, thank, thank you for the question. Thank you. thank you. Hi, Jason. It's Diane. <clears throat> I was just curious if your daughter is, you think will stay involved and will you know, want to continue the family tradition? You know, it's completely up to her, you know, no pressure on my part, you know, I'll, I'm sure there's a sort of normal influence of just me doing it, right? And hopefully I'm not, hopefully that's not pressure in and of itself, but we'll see. You know, the, the, the great thing about my daughter is that she loves to help. And so, you know, she is out there during harvest. She wants to be out there during harvest. You know, she'll be with me tomorrow as we're doing the shoot thinning. Um, so definitely giving her the opportunity, but definitely no pressure. Hey Jason, when you are going to try a different type of wine to produce, are you able to replicate that in like a tiny batch or do you actually have to, um, uh, tr like produce like an entire barrel or even more than a barrel um, in, in, in trying it? Or is that like the process that, okay, we're going to try this. So we'll just kind of do it as a, you know, a larger batch and we'll see how it is. Or the experimentation part is that, you know, can you replicate that in, in a very small thing? Yeah, unfortunately it's, it's difficult um, in the sense of that, to put it in a context a little bit. So all the wines that we're making are from the vineyard that I grew up on, right? The one you saw in the pictures. And that's a primary goal of ours is to not necessarily use grapes from outside the vineyard because this is really about honoring our history and our family. And so, yes, I could theoretically say, oh, let's go make Mikami vineyards and do like a Napa cab and just try like a, buy a, buy a ton of Napa cab and make a, make a Napa cab under the Mikami Vineyards label. Or I could go to another neighboring vineyard in Lodi and say, hey, can I buy a ton of, of um, uh, Pinot Gris or whatever, Sauvignon Blanc. I could do that uh, in a small batch and maybe make you know, two tons, which would translate into maybe like 50 cases of wine. I, I could try and do that. Um, but 
it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't embody our vineyard, right? Because every site is going to be different, right? And so really what I'm trying to do is make stuff from our vineyard to really recognize our location, our vineyard, et cetera. And so for me, um, I can't really do that uh, in that sense. However, you can, you know, I showed you that picture of the, the vineyard. So we are going to dedicate another small block for a new set of varietals. Unfortunately, it won't be just like, you know, a ton or two tons. It's going to be more than that because this is where the economy of scales thing comes into play, where if I'm going to do it, I need to go ahead and commit to converting a certain amount of the, the square footage to this other varietal. So um, it's not the whole vineyard, but it is another small block and we will be producing more varieties off of that small block but it's not like, again, a, a, a tiny amount like you're describing as an experiment. It wouldn't be an experiment. I'd have to commit to a, a little bit of a larger thing. Jump in with both feet if you're gonna do it, huh? So, and that's where, again, thinking about the climate, thinking about what grows well in Lodi is our really kind of key determinants for what, uh, what we wanna grow. Any other questions? These are all great questions. So I appreciate everybody's uh, involvement here. And thank you to everybody in the chat. I read through all the chat. And um, so thank you very much for all the, the nice comments in the uh, chat. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, well, Jason, thank you very much uh, for sharing both your time and also your great generosity and your donation of the wine to JSA. That's very much appreciated. Um, and again, you know, this is part of our 50 year celebration. Jill, uh, uh, can you tell us what we have on the calendar coming up next for um, <laughs> the wonderful programs that you've set up? Um, sure. In June, we'll be um, having a founders um, talk. So the original founders of JSA were actually uh, college students at UC Berkeley. They're not college students anymore. They could be clients of ours. <laughs> but um, yeah, we're going to have them come and share what it was like as young people and what their vision was for the organization. And we're really looking forward to that. And along with that it's been a process of kind of culling the archives and trying to actually collect more photos and identify people and share more stories. So if people have and know, have memories to share of, you know, joining um, or being part of JSA's history, we'd love to hear it. So that's um, coming up in June. Hey, and again, Jason, for, um those of us who are interested in, um, uh, you know, have gotten a favorite of your wines and want to uh, get in touch with you to purchase, um, once again, can you give out your uh, email and your website so that they can sign up for your newsletter? Absolutely. It's uh, jason at mikamivineyards.com. And the website is www.mikamivineyards.com. Oh, thank you, Jill. And let me also say again, um, Kevin, Jill, thank you very much for you know uh, the opportunity to do the presentation and to meet all.